today's gospel lesson covers a, a few things, to say the least. I'm going to give you a little road map of where we're going. We're going to talk about salt. We're going to talk about light and good work and how they interact. And we're also going to talk a little bit about righteousness. Now, one of the challenges we have as modern Christians in reading the Bible is the language the Bible was written in was not English, but ancient Greek. And each language that we have in our world has its advantages and its detriments. Some things just don't translate well. Today, we're faced with one of the challenges of the English language. In the fact that the second person pronoun is the same for the singular and the plural. All right, all right. Enough of this fancy explanation. Okay? I'm going to Texasize or Southernize the first few read verses of our reading from Matthew to show you what I mean. Now, as a new resident of Texas, I'm going to ask your forgiveness in advance. So here we go. Y'all are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Y'all are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let y'all's light shine before others so that they may see the good works and give glory to y'all's Father in heaven. Jesus was talking to a group of people. And he was telling them together, this is what we want you to do. We often see in the text and assume that it's singular, that the text refers to me. Well, often it's not only talking to just you but to you and an implied community. In this case here, Jesus is talking to his disciples as a group. Jesus is telling them that they are like salt and they are like light. Jesus is telling us, a community of followers of Christ, we are salt and light. Salt and light are also good communal symbols. Light is important because it allows things to be seen. Light prevents people from stumbling. With, li with light, people can find their way. Salt is important and useful with other things. Salt can preserve food. And of course, salt brings out the flavor of food. Our faith and actions, now that's salt for the world. Consider this potential bumper sticker. Christianity adding flavor for 2,000 years. That's what we wanted to make people think. It is being the salt light that can help people see the good works of the community. The good works are the work of the kingdom of God. Now, the verses we just read, they really show the message of the gospel. However, if you've grown up Lutheran, you may see or hear the words good works and feel just a tiny tinge of hesitancy because the Lutheran tradition has emphasized the idea of the theology of good works is not to gain our salvation. The Lutheran tradition stresses it is God's grace. God's love is the only source of salvation. So in the Lutheran response, good works has maybe a sullied reputation. So today, I want to take a look at the good works that are stressed here in Matthew and talk about them and their role in the kingdom of God. Now, if you did not grow up Lutheran, the tradition, the idea of good works, is still important to talk about. First, I want to spend a bit of time talking about how Lutherans got to the point of minimizing or lessening the role of good works based on the life of Martin Luther. So let's take some time to talk about the life and times of Brother Martin. Now, Luther's life and writing is very well documented. He did a lot of writing. But here's a little thumbnail sketch. Martin Luther was a German monk in the 1500s. 
at this time, the Catholic Church was rather corrupt. The Catholic Church was also the only game in town. If you were living in the Christian area of Europe, you were a member of the Catholic Church. Martin Luther was what we would call today a church worker. Luther was very well educated, and his need to know, coupled with an intense sense of guilt, led him to try to do more and more good works, more and more acts of penance to ensure his salvation, because he was really worried. Luther was always worried. Can he do enough to make up for his sin? Can he do enough? He was intensely concerned that he just had not done enough good works to make up for his sins. Now, as Luther read the Bible, he realized that salvation, oh, that is a gift entirely from God. There's nothing we can do, nothing we can do to save our lives for heaven. God has done it all, done everything. All we can do is accept the grace and love and live as forgiven people. With this assurance, Luther saw more abuses in the church. The selling of indulgences was particularly extreme in its corruption, and thus triggered Luther. So what was an indulgence? Okay. So an indulgence is based on this strange idea of accounting for sins and good things. You see, sin had done so many good works that they had a credit balance in their sin account. Okay? The church had credits of good work in its account and could give them up to sinful people who had a deficit, who needed some good works. But rather than spend time in purgatory working off your good works deficit, the church would give you credits to cut back or eliminate, eliminate your time in purgatory. Okay? You all remember the get-out-of-jail-free card from Monopoly? Well, indulgence was a get-out-of-purgatory at a lower fee or a lower year cost. So during Luther's time, indulgences were being sold to finance this new cathedral in Rome. And next we have all sorts of events which lead to the Reformation. And I'm going to allow you to follow your interest and learn more about Luther and the Reformation. But one of the central points of the Reformation, especially from the standpoint of Lutherans, is the importance of grace. Our salvation, our true existence here and in the next life, there's nothing we can do to assure it. God has done it all. God's grace and love is the source of salvation. We can do nothing to earn salvation. Now, we come back to good works. The problem with good works in terms of the Reformation is good works, effort, and right acts by human beings were required by the Catholic Church. And the term for humans thinking that they can contribute or put in effort toward their own salvation is called works righteousness. Thus, in some reform circles, you know, Reformation circles, Doing good work is looked at with suspicion because of the worry that that person is doing that good work in order to get enough credits to get into heaven. Now, all of this thinking and rationale for doing good work is some pretty solid human reasoning. We all like to think that if you're doing the right thing, if you're doing good, you're going to get some sort of reward. The of karma is based on the idea that good and right things will be rewarded and bad and evil will be punished. Now, down, we humans have the desire to see a reward for the good and punishment for the bad. We want to see this kind of karmic justice of good getting rewards and bad getting punished. Now, if we are really honest with ourselves, what we want to see is mercy for ourselves and justice for everyone else. So if good works do not help us get into heaven, what's the use? If we're trying to do the right thing and the right thing does not make us look any better in God's sight, why do we do them? Let's go back.
back to the gospel reading. And you look at what is missing in your bulletin. Jesus tells us to shine our light before others so that they can see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. Jesus is telling us that having others see what we do will give glory to God. Our actions, our good works will be an example, an example of the real difference that God can make in people's lives. You see, good works, not for us. Good works will not give us any heaven credits. Jesus has taken care of all of our salvation requirements. We just need to trust. We just need to have faith. Now, I can think of two, although there are plenty more, but I'm going to stick with two for today. Reasons to do good works. One, a simple response to the grace and love of God. We respond with efforts to do good because God has first loved us. We can do nothing to receive God's love. God unconditional no conditions we can simply praise and say thank you following god's command to do what is good is a way to say thank you another reason for good works is others we are sharing god's love with others our actions our relationships can help others see the grace and love of god See, the Bible has the words of God, and Jesus is the living word of God. And you may be an example of that word of God for people you meet and interact with. Your interaction with people as a follower of Christ is described by Jesus through these metaphors of salt and light. Salt and light are useful here in Matthew and do not necessarily are ends in themselves. I don't think Jesus was trying to describe salvation or Holy Spirit with salt and light. I think Jesus was showing, through the examples of salt and light, how we can share the good news about the life in Christ. Let your light and your salt be that natural, divine, God-made spark and God that God has provided with you to be up front, to be seen by the world. Do not hide yourself from being the you that you were lovingly made to be. Do not hide yourself under a basket. Let your particular flavor, as you are, show the way of God to others. Let the good works of God be put up front with your very selves as individuals, but also as a community of God working together through the good times and the bad times. It is difficult for us Western Christians to think of the commands and words of Jesus to be spoken to and for community. We often get hung up on the word in the Bible that is directed to us individually, or is it to us as a community? You or y'all? I don't know that we always need to go back to the Greek to figure this one out. I think the answer to the question about whether we should view the word of Jesus as directed to us as individuals or us as a community should be yes. It's probably best to consider the words of God to be both for us as individuals and for us as a group. I want to take a look at the last sentence of the reading, where Jesus tells his disciples that unless their righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, they will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, although Jesus in this reading has just spoken about the law in very great detail and talked about its importance, I don't think Jesus is telling his disciples, yeah, you need to be better at adhering to the law than the Pharisees. I think Jesus is urging his disciples to focus on what is true for the benefit of others. In order to enter the kingdom of God, a disciple needs to see the world with God's eyes. And 
God does not desire adherence of doing good for the sake of personal reward, which I think is what Jesus was implying to the scribes and Pharisees. Rather to be righteous, to do good for the sake of others and the benefit of others. God's good works are done for others is not works righteousness. Good works, helping people in big and small ways, is what God asks us to do. 